for a chair, it's not a class. Right, so let me introduce myself first. I'm Madhu Padoria, and I'm director RIO Sitapur. And I'm very happy to be with so many of you because I'm so used to having you people around, right? So uh, I'll just want to check on the faculty who all are there, so I call accordingly. Dr. Ashwin is there. Dr. Santan is there. Deepak is not there. Chandrima is not there. Dr. Maroj Mathur is there. Kirti is not there, and I'm there, right? <laughs> so let's start with the first, second speaker. And then whatever is missing, if they come in time, well and good. If they do not come in time, then what I will do is we'll have some kind of an interactive portion of those things because the time is precious, let's not waste it, right? So we have something interactive without slides, but we'll talk about it, right? So now the first speaker will be Dr. Ashwin, and he will be talking about a patient, evaluation of a patient with squint. So Dr. Ashwin, please. Um, time is not written over here, so take 15 minutes. But just stick to 15 minutes because the people can pop in in between also. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I just wanted to know what, yep. how much time. Yeah. I'll try. It should be fairly uh, large topic in 15 minutes. But so I'm going to be speaking about uh, evaluation of squint today, and it's of course a blanket large topic in a short time. So I think what I'm going to try and do is just touch up on practical aspects of it uh, rather than uh, spend a lot of time with the non-practical part. So essentially, uh, history taken in squint, I think the few important things that you have to take is onset. Once you know when the squint has started, immediately you've already got differential diagnosis in mind. So if something's there in infancy, you're looking at infantile squints. If you're looking at something that's come slightly later in life, you're looking at intermittent exotropias and accommodative esotropias slightly later in life. And of course, if it's recent origin in an adult, you're looking at cranial nerve palsy. So onset duration, that gives you a lot. Um, diplopia, again, something you will always get in cranial nerve palsies mainly or restrictive strabismus. So that's some of the things, apart from the regular history, you should pick up on this. Knowing uh, birth history and family history, essentially preterm babies, more chance of ha getting squint. Uh, family history of refractive errors and squint, again, more chance of getting squint. Children with neurological issues, uh, delayed milestones, again, have a higher chance of just getting your infantile squints, just higher chance of getting intermittent exos. So get into that, get into the history of milestones. You should know some brief milestones so that you know that this child is delayed and that can be connected. Sometimes you have acute squints in children uh, post a viral illness. So again, getting an acute history, especially if the squint is of recent origin. Of course, uh, you have to go into the past ocular history, which is relevant essentially in squint is glasses, patching, as well as any form of surgery done in the past. So let's come to the main part, which is examination of a squint. So essentially the first three points that you see here, you should be able to judge those before the patient sits on your chair. So as they're walking in, you should be able to detect that there's some facial asymmetry, that probably this patient has walked in with a head posture, and you can see an obvious ptosis. So again, ptosis will connect with a third nerve, facial asymmetry with a fourth nerve, and abnormal head posture could be due to nystagmus or the patient trying to get into an area of binocularity. Vision checking uh, is important. Always check, uniocular, binocular, distance, near, with glasses, without glasses. So you have to have all these readings before you start evaluating the squint. That instrument there that you see, that's uh, an orthopedic instrument. It's a very basic instrument used to, m to measure uh, face turn, uh, mainly face turn. It can also be used for head tilt. It's called a goniometer. Okay, cycloplegic refraction whatever form of cycloplegia you want to use, either atropine or CTC protocol or homide. Essentially, you need to know the refractive status to connect it with the squint. So hyperopes are more prone to esos. Exos are connected with myopes. All squints will have better fusion, better control, 
if their visual acuity is good. So giving glasses just to improve visual acuity is a form of treating squint, okay? So don't ignore refractive errors. Okay, now let's come to the actual motor evaluation of a squint. So yes, a Hirschberg test. So that's a Hirschberg test, just shining a light, looking at the corneal reflex. And in your undergrad also you would know, center of the pupil, zero degrees, at the edge of the pupil, 15, 30, and 45, okay? So that, uh, when do you do this actually? You do it uh, when you have an uncooperative patient, when you have a child, when you have a patient who doesn't have, doesn't fixate for some reason. So one eye is low vision or blind. Your cover test requires good fixation, but Hirschberg does it. So it, it's definitely useful in these two situations. One, when you've got an uncooperative patient or a child. Two, when you've got a blind eye, okay? So it really helps you evaluate the angle. So yes, you can have an abnormal Hirschberg if you have a strabismus. So that's point number two. You have a strabismus, you have an abnormal Hirschberg. But you may also get an abnormal Hirschberg in a case of pseudostrabismus, okay? So there are many reasons for pseudostrabismus, but the commonest one is a large angle kappa. So I'm not going to go into the depth of uh, telling you about abnormal retinal correspondence. Uh, this last point there is eccentric fixation, okay? so. There is some confusion between eccentric fixation and abnormal retinal correspondence, okay? These both will have an abnormal Hirschberg. And eccentric fixation is because there's some problem with the macula, like a macular scar or a drag macula, something very obvious in the, in the fundus examination. Well, an abnormal retinal correspondence is secondary to a squint where your macula will be perfect. Your retina examination will be perfect, okay? So both of these situations use an extra foveal site, but one has an abnormal fundus examination, one doesn't. A little bit about angle kappa. Angle kappa is the angle between the center of the pupil and the visual axis, okay? That's usually positive, which is why your corneal reflex is slightly nasal to the center of the pupil, which is normal. But sometimes it's significantly nasal to the uh, center of the pupil, and that uh, is a larger angle kappa and will give you an appearance of an exo. So uh, the way to know you're dealing with a pseudostrabismus versus a strabismus is a cover test. Your cover test has no movement, there's no, there's no true squint. So let's come to the cover test. Actually the name of the test is a cover test, but you have to cover and then uncover. Okay, so when you cover, you look at the eye that is visible, that is the uncovered eye. When you uncover, you look at the eye that is uncovered. You cannot look at both eyes at the same time. So make sure you know where to look when you're doing the cover test. Do cover test with glasses, without glasses, for near and distance always. So let's just see some videos on cover test. Okay, let me, let me just tell you what you're looking for. So there's cover, there's no movement, which means there's no tropia. But when you cover and there is movement, you're dealing with a tropia. When you uncover, no movement on cover, but movement on uncover is a fovea. So this is the basic difference. I'm sure you all have read that. After doing a cover test for each eye, what is the advantage of doing an alternate cover test? As soon as you cover one eye, you're dissociating the eye, you're breaking fusion. An alternate cover test is just a stronger dissociation. It's just much stronger than just covering. So all the hidden squint all the minor phorias come out. So the maximum squint is measured in an alternate cover test, which is why we do the prism bar cover test with the alternate cover, so you can measure the whole squint, okay? So the alternate cover, the other thing that alternate cover helps you with is, once you've done alternate cover, alternate cover, then you leave and create binocularity, and then you see what happens. If the patient straightens, you're dealing with a phoria. So if the patient remains in a tropia, you see which eye is tropic, you then find which is the dominant eye. So let's see some videos of the same, okay? So this is a, cover. looks fairly straight. You cover one eye, Haan, no movement of the, un of the uncover. Eye. Now on uncover, you saw no, the the that shows this is a fovea. Now all Achai, the cover keep it covered for some time and then uncover. You see how that small fovea becomes such a big one. 
So let's see this next patient. This is an obvious exo, right? So you cover this eye, he comes in to take up fixation. You uncover, he goes back. What does this tell you? It tells you that the right eye is dominant and he prefers to squint the left eye. That's all it says. So you can say that this patient is a left exotropia. When I say the word left exotropia, I don't mean that his right eye doesn't squint. Right eye squints under cover. It just tells you about the dominance. It just tells you right eye is dominant. When I say the word diagnosis left exotropia, right eye is dominant. That's all I'm saying. Okay? All right. Just an example of an ESO. Okay, this, the left eye does look a little ESO. So you cover the right. The left takes up fixation. Uncover, it goes back. Again, this is a patient with a right dominance. Left squint. Cover the squinting eye. Make no move. All right. Look at the apple. Look at the apple. Go now. Look at the apple. She will keep alternating. Keep looking at the apple. Right. So this is just an example Very of good. a look at the apple. ESO. Look Similarly. At the apple. Okay. Now let's see this patient. Okay. We started straight with an alternate cover space. Come on, Bhagatra. Now I'm saying, if you let go, create fusion. After a few seconds, it goes in. Come on, Bhagatra. Telling you. Same sort of. Come on, Bhagatra. Lens for it. Intermittent exo. So these are some of the examples of cover test. Let's measure the squint. So the test we use is a prism bar cover test. It's a bar with all uh, right angle prisms placed on it. And you can do it for near distance with and without glasses, okay? Sometimes, and the end point is no movement, okay? So let us see how this works, okay? So here we have this same patient that we saw before. Yes. We're placing, uh, prism bar with the apex pointing towards the squint. And we keep increasing the uh, prism and we keep going and you see there's still movement, still movement, the movement is reducing but it's still going on. We realize I've reached the end of the bar which is 45 in this bar. We say, oh God, this is uh, not enough. Let's use something else. So now I'm using a 50 uh, mm. loose prism and you find that that's not enough either. And then we're going to use one prism in each eye, so I've split it, I'm holding it like okay. this, you can have this another assistant hold it or you can have a patient hold it. Now in this situation you will see okay. the move mm. movement is almost okay. not there, but you also see a redress okay. movement, see eye comes in and then goes out again. You see that? Okay. That's called a redress movement. I'm just going to take a second to talk to you about redress. Redress means you've got an exo, you expect the eye to come from out to in, but it not only comes to the center, but it goes slightly in and comes out, that's a redress. And that usually occurs when you're very close to the neutralization point. And then you get confused, have I reached neutralization or have I overdone it? So one way to reduce redress movement is to move your cover slightly away from the face but still blocking the object. And as soon as you do that, the redress movement goes away because it's easier for that eye to locate the object because just behind this little cover, not in a whole field. So that's a practical point to take away. A Krimsky test is essentially a Hirschberg test with a prism, okay? So you put a prism, keep on increasing the prisms, and you see uh, that the corneal reflex keeps coming towards the center, and as you find it approximately right at the center, that's your measurement. So it is a very objective test. You don't require the patient's cooperation. Again, the same indications as Hirschberg. Uncooperative child, uncooperative patient, or poor vision. You need cover test when you need good vision, huh? Oh, I hear some sounds. Is that for me? Is that a warning or my time's up? One minute warning? Oh, good, that's good. So I'm gonna run through this a little bit. Four prism diopter test uh, is used to diagnose microtropia. So you can see here, uh, that's the movement that's gonna take place. Uh, when you place a five, four diopter prism with a base out, this eye will move in, my herrings, this eye will move in, and then it, this eye realizes I'm not looking at the object, and it moves back. If this happens, it's normal. But if you had a microtropia in this eye, there would be no movement at all, okay? Uh, that's practically how you do it. I think more than doing the test, you should know when to do it. So four prism diopter test is done when you have slightly reduced vision in one eye and you can't explain it. So you've got macular OCT done, everything else, Six, nine vision, what's happening? 
focus on diopter microtropia, which you're missing. That's the cause of the amblyopia. Okay, extraocular movements, um, all nine gazes. Remember to do extraocular movements with a torchlight, okay, rather than with an object. You, you don't need to take, you need to know how far to take it so that both eyes are viewing that object. So you'll see the corneal reflex and you know how out to go. Ductions and versions should be done. Ductions are more important to tell you about the actual movement of that eye, uh, which is a uniocular movement. Convergence should be measured. This is all a part of extraocular movements. All of this is pursuit movements, extraocular movements. You're following an object, that's pursuit. Also check saccades. Pen, finger, pen, finger, horizontal and vertical. So let's skip this video. Let's go into some sensory tests. This is a common distance sensory test, okay? And uh, this is normal suppression in diplopia. I'm going to show you the last slide. I'm being attacked from here. But so. Um, yep, uh, Maddox rod test, okay, this is a test that is a subjective test to pick up phorias. One eye has a Maddox rod, will show a vertical line, this is a dissociation, both eyes get dissociated, you cannot fuse these two images and so a phoria is revealed, which can be measured as well, so vertical as well as horizontal. A white Maddox rod in front of the right and the red in front of the left or whatever, the normal response is this, but if you have a torsion, I think this is it. Ashwin, I think. Yeah, I think. So these are the sensory tests, and I'm just gonna say one thing. If you have to get one, get this one in the top left corner. It has no monocular clues, and uh, that's why. So that's probably the best one to have, okay, if you have to get one, okay. And uh, now I'll request Dr. San, uh, Santan Gopalam to please come and. Amblyopia is by itself is, is practically a long question. It wouldn't be asked so much in the practicals yeah. unless until you get a squint, which you don't get very often in the exam. But theory is a long question, so please listen to him carefully what he says. Okay, good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm supposed to teach you my 40 years of experience in amblyopia. Huh? In, 15 in 15 minutes. In 15 minutes. So if you don't understand a word, don't blame me. <laughs> if you understand, well and good, but if you want to understand more, come and buy me a beer, I'll teach you. So all three options. I'll interrupt are. here. Only 40 years experience person can put in 15 minutes. A yeah. neophyte cannot. So you are the right person. Please go ahead. <laughs> I hope so. Where is that page down? I can't see. I have a problem with presbyopia also, which I thought I never had. Page down. No, it is not working. Which one? No. Oh, it's not working. It's not, not working. working. So it's not my fault. Oh, it is. Oh, it suddenly, is. it has gone somewhere else. Come. Go to the second. So you need to know the definition of anything you know. Second slide, you, you have put it somewhere else, this slide. Come, come here, young man, come here. Now you need to know the definition of amblyopia. Amblyopia is being defined for a long, long time. Everybody keeps reading the same thing. Patient doesn't see anything. The uh, uh, doctor doesn't see anything and therefore amblyopia. This, this has been by heart and without realizing any meaning of amblyopia. Okay, go to the second slide. Go back, okay. Okay, the old, uh, this is forwards, right? This is backwards. Okay, so you need to know the proper definition of amblyopia and uh, you don't bring that ice cream thing uh, one minute earlier because you have wasted a lot of time. So you need to know the process of vision and uh, process of perception and you need to know the, what is the current management and you need to know whether it is treatable at all and what are the future trends in the management of amblyopia. The old definition has to die. Any old textbook, any old definition has to die. There is no alternative because as our knowledge improves, as our knowledge base improves, we realize that it is no longer the truth. That's what the, the Veda also say, that you put 
believe in something and you believe truly until you find a better truth. The truth is only a path. It is not the end. You can never reach the end of the truth. It's only a path. So have we defined amblyopia yet? Have we used all the modalities available for diagnosing and treating it? If you ask me, the, diagno the, the definition of amblyopia is a dustbin diagnosis. Because you rule out all other conditions, then only you can say, ah, this is, must be amblyopia with a problem in the brain. <laughs> now, there are, although there are many causes for amblyopia, like strabismus, anisometropia, high hemetropia, and visual deprivation, the treatment for all these things by all us has been the same blind patch. Patch the eye. If a child is not able to move with counting finger, patch the eye, hold the child and move around. We haven't said anything more than patch the eye. Four hours, six hours, we go on eloquently about four hours, six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 26 hours of patching, etc. So it's meaningless. Although the uh, amblyopia is associated with a number of visual deficits like hyperacuity, shape perception, spatial interaction, contour integration, visual counting, reduced or absent stereopsis, and motion, motion processing. Now, these things cannot be explained just by uh, V1 pathology. There must be a lot of problems ev everywhere in the brain in amblyopia. So, how do I treat amblyopia? I need to have a good knowledge of the, the neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, neuropathology, and all the ophthalmic specialities before you diagnose and treat amblyopia. So, that's why I'm going to teach you some basics you don't have to get worked up about beyond certain point because it becomes big, too difficult to understand. Vision is a dichotomous process. There is a nasal retina, there is temporal retina starting from retina. Then it goes up to lateral geniculate body where there is nasal and temporal dichotomy again. Then it goes to the cortex and the lowest level where it goes to the cortex is V1. There are horizontal connections between all these pathways and there are bottom up impulses going from retina to the V1, and there are top-down corticogenical impulses, which I have now realized come right up to retina. Because of my instrument, I have realized the corticogenical pathway does not stop at LGB, but it comes down to the retina as well. I'll tell you more about it as we go on. Remember this, the so-called top-down impulses coming down from the corticogenical pathway modulate the retinal impulses, and these are what we are utilizing in treating amblyopia, which nobody has told you till today. In the lateral geniculate body, as I said, there is a strict segregation of right and left eye, not like the traffic in Bangalore or in uh, Mumbai, where anybody can drive in, in whichever direction they feel like. If the brain does that, everyone will be mad completely. So the impulses do not cross each other. They are strictly segregated at lateral geniculate body. P cells are segregated, M cells are segregated, and they go to different layers in lateral geniculate body. There is a reason why it happens. We'll go to that a little bit later. So if you look at this, uh, if you look at this picture, a few more things will become clearer to you. Now, why am I telling you all these things? Because you need to understand where is the problem in amblyopia. Is it in lateral geniculate body? Is it in the retina? Is it in occipital cortex? If it is in occipital cortex, where is it? You can see here the, uh, the, the fibers cross and the nasal fibers goes to the opposite side, temporal fibers go to the ipsilateral side. Most of the macular fibers go to the lateral part of the occipital cortex and most of the magnocellular fibers go to the medial side of the occipital cortex. So the P cell has got a larger representation in the occipital cortex unlike the M cells in the retina. Now, if you look at, the, again, uh, the v, V1 area is the lowest level of the occipital cortex. And if you look at the occipital cortex, you see there are six layers, one, two, three, four, five, six, very simple to uh, remember. But if you look at it again more carefully, you realize that layer four has 4A, 4B, 4C. And layer 4C again has 4C alpha, 4C beta. Now, what is the function of all those layers? So many layers and so many variations are there. I'll tell you in a few seconds, and the 80% of the cells in the cortex are binocular, and only 20% at the level of uh, uh, the level 4A and level 4B, they are monocular, and that's why it is called as uh, 
uh, stray generi because there is a very strict segregation of the layers of the right and left fibers in that level. The 4C, 4B and all they are binocular. So if you look at that, LGN is not a simple realization. Only 30% of the impulses from the LGN goes to the cortex. If all the impulses from LGN go to the cortex, the brain gets thoroughly confused and short-circuited and you start behaving like Poppu. Now, after modification, it also receives the LGN also receives the corticogeniculate modulating fibers. These corticogeniculate modulating fibers rapidly send the impulses from LGN to V1 when they come down from occipital cortex or further right. So this is the classification, parvocellular, magnocellular, parvocellular, magnocellular go to layer one, one and two ventrally, and the magnocellular go to three, four, five, six in the dorsal area, and it obviously parvocellular occupies a larger area compared to the magnocellular cells. Now they have a different function. The parvocellular cells ass assess what is called as what of vision, and the magnocellular cells assess the wear of vision. If the what and wear of vision are not properly controlled, then what happens is you will become like Ajit Agarkar. He, first time he saw the ball, but he didn't know what it was. He knew the position of the ball, but he didn't know it was a ball. So he got out for zero. Second time he s knew what it was, but he didn't know where it was. So like that he got himself out five times in the cricket for zero. That's because he had a problem with what and where of vision, okay? So you need to know where is what and what is where. If you don't know, then you will have severe problems if you are walking around with your girlfriend when your wife is around, or if you are walking around with wife when another wife is around. <laughs> that is even a greater danger. Anyway, let us look at it. Six layers of the visual cortex, I've told you, A, B, C uh, in the layer four. The M fibers end in layer 4C alpha, and the P fibers end in layer 4C beta. There is a reason why God has diverged the functions of the various things, because the what of vision involves the size, the shape, the structure, the color, and the surface of the object, whereas the wear of the object is position and uh, movement of the object. However, these two are interconnected throughout the uh, uh, central nervous system, and that's what I have utilized in treating the amblyopia. Now, this is further ahead. The uh, V1 acts simply as a fast forwarding center. It doesn't analyze. It doesn't have the capacity to analyze. It will say, escalate it and send it off to the higher center and say, you fellows analyze, I don't know what it is, and you tell me, and then I'll take action accordingly. So they send it off to a number of centers, V2, V3, V4, mid-temporal, et cetera, et cetera, for further analysis from V1, okay? Now, this is how the brain connection is. From occipital cortex, there is connection to every part of the brain. So once upon a time, four, 5,000 years ago, they said, Sarvendriyanam, Nayanam, Pradhanam, and it is so true. If you did not know, you will say, what nonsense is talking, some Sanskrit dead language. You don't know the language, you say, how can you say dead language? You understand my point. If you have, you must have confidence in what you have done. You must have confidence in your culture, in your upbringing, and in your uh, in your uh, language. If you don't have, you end up talking in English, which has less meaning and less number of words. Okay, what happened? Uh, uh, mm, so this is the spaghetti junction of. Isko kuch karo yar, boss. Uh, okay, this is the spaghetti junction which you are seeing in V1. Now, what happens in amblyopia? In amblyopia, the vision in the one of the eye is reduced. Now, how do I know vision is reduced? By checking the vision. But what happens in the brain? In the brain, what happens is, when the patient fixates with the amblyopic eye, the biological oxygen level dependence scan shows reduced scan in V1. That means the, when you are fixing with amblyopic eye, the brain is not utilizing oxygen and so it doesn't want the blood. This is what happens in bold scan in amblyopia. 
particularly in ambulio, uh, in any scan, if you do, if you are looking at the face of a girl, the oxygen consumption of the brain is more than if you are looking at the building, the oxygen consumption is much less. It, but if there are some girls like in uh, West Bengal chief minister, it will be less than the, <laughs> less than the building. Okay, that apart. This is the PET scan of an amblyopic eye which shows higher oxygen consumption, higher consumption or higher, they, uh, they tag the thing, fibrinogen and things like that. And PET scan also shows in amblyopia there is a reduced thing. Now, in amblyopia, what happens? This is a small eye, but it has an extensive change all over the brain because of a small eye. Small eye has a problem, but it has caused problems everywhere in the brain. So if this can cause everywhere problems in the brain, is amblyopia an eye problem or is it a brain, pro brain problem? You need to understand. So brain also can elicit certain reactions to control and to, to eliminate the problems created by the brain. I mean, problems created by the eye. So brain also tries its best. That's called as a process of emetropization. Now, from the eye, LGN, striated cortex, and extra striated cortex, all are affected in amblyopia because of a problem in the eye. Now, should we find a way more convenient, more result-oriented, and quicker method of treatment than months and months and years of patching of the eye? I would, I would find, should we not should we not utilize all the other technologies like Bolt scan, PET scan, DTI scan, MRI scan, etc., etc., to see where is the problem instead of just blindly saying amblyopia past the eye. Amblyopia past the eye. So, what I am presenting here is what is called as orthoptic from the Carditech medical devices. We have designed an instrument which utilizes the so-called top-down impulses coming down from the parietal lobe to the occipital lobe level for C beta. And that stimulates the fast forwarding of impulses from 4 C beta to the inferotemporal cortex for rapid analysis of the image. As I told you, if you remember, occipital cortex V1 is only a forwarding center. It does not do anything to the image, analysis of the image. But the parietal center, which has an attention center in the parietal area, parietal lobe. The attention center in the parietal lobe, in turn, sends the impulses down to the occipital cortex V1 layer 4C beta, where P cells come. And uh, if the, uh, the images, if the impulses from the attention center come down to V1, one minute I have finished? Okay, I'll take one minute. If the attention center in parietal lobe comes down to V1, before the bottom-up impulses from the retina reach V1, the fast forwarding of the impulses at V1 is produced up to 10,000 times by the top-down impulses. So the critical point is that the gamma impulses coming from retina to the V1 must come after, or there should be a not a, a large gap between the gamma impulses and the alpha-beta impulses coming down from the parietal lobe. And that leads to rapid improvement in vision uh, in children. Within 15 days, I've seen children with amblyopia improving to 6'6". Adults age 55 improving to 6'6". So no age is exempt from treating amblyopia. Don't send the children home saying nothing can be done, no treatment available. Please don't say that. Amblyopia can be treated. We have experience of over 150,000 patients, myself, and 50 other people who have bought uh, the machine based on my words, they are extremely happy with the machine. I think I'll stop at that. You can copy the, uh, all these things improve in amblyopia patients. You can copy my email if you want. And success rate is around 95% in three to six months. 
I am an orthoptic graduate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, sir, for that illuminating talk. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Deepak Mishra, but I'm told that he's not here. So, yes, please, yes. So you're Dr. Navindu Rai. Yeah, I'm Dr. Navindu Rai. Okay, yeah, please and go uh, ahead. I have been asked to give yeah. this presentation just one hour back. Yeah, so, so please uh, go ahead, yeah. I'm basically a retina guy, and Madhu Ram is here, who is teacher of teachers in glaucoma. So please pardon me <laughs> if I'm negligent on some topics. I'm with you, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. So I'm Dr. Navin Durai, I'm proxying Dr. Deepak Mishra, and I'll be talking about uh, the intraocular pressure measurement in the concept of target IOP. Raised IRP is one of the primary risk factors for glaucoma that one can treat. Normal IRP in, is ranged from 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. The facts are the people lose vision with glaucoma because of problems with optic nerve neuropathy, but they develop the optic neuropathy because of elevated IOP. For clinicians, the most important fact is that by controlling the pressure, we currently have the best way of preventing the blindness. According to the advanced glaucoma uh, initiation study, Reducing IRP in glaucoma patients limits disease progression and shows slows down the visual field loss. According to the early management uh, glaucoma trial study, for every one millimeter drop into IRP, a 10% reduction in risk of glaucomatous progression was observed. Tonometry is the pr procedure for the measurement of IOP. IRP is the most important risk factor for the development and progression of glaucoma. It is the only factor that can be treated and modified in the management of glaucoma. Therefore, the need for accurate and reproducible measurement of IOP is of utmost importance. Clinical measurement of IOP has undergone several technical advances from the initial digital tension measurements through indentation tonometry to apprehension tonometry and now to non-contact tonometry. The current gold standard still remains to be the Goldman apprehension tonometer. So this is a, a flowchart showing us that integral pressure measurement can be done by monometry or tonometry or transpalpable IOP measurement can be done. In tonometry, we have indentation, we have apprehension, we have combined apprehension indentation tonometry, we have rebound tonometry, contour tonometer. In apprehension, we have non-contact type and contact type. In contact, we have fixed area variable force and fixed force variable area tonometers. Just to simplify, this, this is tonometry is direct or indirect. Direct is by monometry. Indirect is by indentation and apprehension. In apprehension, we have contact, non-contact. In contact, we have Goldman and Perkins. And in non-contact, we have APF and pulse air tonometers. We'll be taking, talking brief about these tonometers in the subsequent slides. In indentation tonometer, plunger is there to indent the cornea. The shape of the deformation is a truncated cone. And the, the significant volume of intraocular fluid that is displayed, it measures the intraocular pressure. In apprehension tonometry, the force only is used to flatten the cornea. And the shape of deformation is a simple flattening. A uh, shear tonometer has been uh, used age long. It has some five uh, false high IRP readings like in cases of thick cornea, very steep corneas, significant cornea pathology, irregular surface could be uh, because of that. In the Goldman intervention tonometer remains the gold standard in the routine ophthalmic practice. The principle is invert flick principle, also referred to as Makalov flick law in which pressure is equals to force per unit area. And this is how it looks like. There are two rings in this. Uh, if you if you uh, you just stain the uh, eye with fluorescein, and then when you indent it, if the rings are in this fashion, that means the IOP is higher than what is been shown. So you need to move the uh, block clockwise. If this is how it is shown, then this is a lower IOP than what it is actually reading. So you need to go anti-clockwise. And if you, if the, if the, if the, both the inner edges of the rings, they touch, then this is the actual IOP, which can be reproduced on every uh, time. That is why it is gold standard. Others are like per Perkins apprehension tonometer. It is inaccurate on scarred edematous or irregular corneas. Readings are consistent and comparable with the Goldman apprehension. It is a handheld tonometer, especially useful for infants and children who cannot sit in the slit lamp. 
Dragon Appellation Thermometer, it is similar to the Goldman and Perkins, except that the difference by prism is used, it has an electric motor that varies the force. This instrument is also portable and useful in similar situations like Perkins. This handheld thermometer weighs only 700 grams, so it is very light weighted. In Mackay Mar Thermometer, it is a new electronic appellation thermometer. It functions by applanating the cornea with a probe in the center of which it has a small 1.5 millimeter diameter plunger that senses the ocular tension. Uh, now also, we also have the newer tonometers like non-contact tonometry, ocular response analyzer, tonopen, pneumatic tonometer, uh, DCT which is Pascal, dynamic contact tonometer, rebound tonometers, transferable tonometer, continuous IP monitoring systems, and diatonic. In uh, NCT, the benef it is beneficial in mass glaucoma screenings because it does not require topical anesthesia and with proper use, there is no risk of injuring the cornea. The advantages are it is useful in screening programs, operable by non-medical personnel, it is user friendly, and no anesthesia is required. In the ocular response analyzers, uh, which is by Richard Corporation USA, it measures the corneal response to indentation by a rapid air pulse. The, uh, it measures the corneal hysteresis which is a measure of the viscous dampening characteristics of corneal tissue, alternative to the gold standard, the gold man appellation The indications for uh, ORA is measurement of intraocular pressure and assessment of the biochemical response to the cornea as tools in the diagnosing and monitoring of patients with glaucoma, to evaluate the potential for post-surgical complications in patients who are being considered for refractive surgery, for assessing the biochemical properties of the cornea in keratoconus. Tonopen is a portable version of Mackay Mark tonometer. IOP is recorded as a wavefront. It is useful for irregular corneas as the area of preparation is very small and it's uh, because it is not dependent on the optical system. It gives accurate readings over contact lens as well. In band keratopathy, it overestimates the IOP. It gives higher values in eyes with low IOP and lower values in eyes with high IOP when compared to the Goldman and, and uh, apprentice tonometer. Pneumatic tonometer is, it is a simple, it is a similar in principle and recordings are similar to Mackay Mark tonometer. It appropriates cornea with a probe that is supported by a column of gas and hence the sensing device is air pressure. It is useful for diseased corneas being non-optical and it can be used for continuous monitoring of IOP. It is different from the air puff tonometer. Pascal is a dynamic contour tonometer the principle of, uh, is by uh, contour matching. It is developed to eliminate errors inherent in previous tonometers such as the effect of corneal thickness and rigidity. Commercially available by Swiss Microtechnology, the instrument is mounted on a slit lamp. The instrument measures IOP in both diastolic and systolic phase of the cardiac cycle, so it takes time. And the difference in the two is the ocular pulse amplitude. Drawbacks are it is more time consuming, does seem as, doesn't seem as useful in diseased corneas, or after a coronal transplantation. Read, read a little higher than apprentice tonometer in people with thin or average thickness corneas, and the recurrent cost of disposable tip is also there. In rebound tonometer, these are handled ballistic devices that measure the return bounce motion of an object impacting the cornea. The diameter of 0.9 millimeter and weight of uh, 26.5 milligram, it is an easy to use instrument and no anesthesia is required. Hence, it is useful in children too. CCT, the uh, center column thickness, affects readings more than in GCT, DGAT. In transplant papillary tonometer, it is not very um, um, commonly used. It is basically used by patients for self-tonometry. And uh, drawback is that patients with field loss may not perceive the phosph uh, phosphines that are seen in this tonometry. Uh, this is a new thing, which is continuous IP monitoring, monitoring by trigger fish. Sensimetric fish, which, is, which can be used for 24-hour IOP recording, including sleeping hours. The patient wears the contact lens up to 24 hours and assures, assumes normal activities, including the sleep periods. The disadvantage is very high cost right now. Dietin tonometer, it is a portable and handheld tonometer. It does not require cellulation or anesthesia. It, does not affect, it is not affected by central corneal thickness or corneal rigidity. So uh, apart from the uh, normal conditions in which uh, Goldman tonometer is the uh, gold standard, we have certain special situations in which certain uh, tonometers can be more useful, like in irregular corneas, pneumatic tonometer, Mackay Mark, Tonopen, or GCT, DCT that is Pascal is uh, more helpful. Or soft contact lenses, pneumatic tonometer and Tonopen is useful. In gas filled eyes, pneumatic tonometer and Tonopen is useful. For post-LASIK status, Pascal is very uh, useful. 
in children and screening programs, Perkins, NCT, or eye care uh, pneumometer to pneumo is, is uh, helpful. So now we'll be coming, talking about the target pressure concept. What is target pressure? A target pressure should be set as a goal of long-term therapy. It should be chosen on an individual basis, weighing potential benefits and risks of treatment for each patient. The goal of the clinician while treating patients with glaucoma should be to lower the intraocular pressure to a level that is safe for that particular eye. So you need to measure this uh, target pressure. You need to decide what should be the target pressure. Per, I mean, it is individualized. So the definition of uh, tar target IOP is, it may be defined as a pressure, rather a range of intraocular pressure levels within which the progression of the glaucoma and visual field loss will be delayed or halted. Individualized target pressure according to risk profile at the time of diagnosis. Setting target IOP, the factors to be considered are IOP level at which optic nerve damage occurred, extent and rate of progression of glaucomatous damage if known by the previous records, presence of other risk factors, patient's age, expected lifespan, and the medical history of the patient. The AO guidelines for the target IOP are if the patient is uh, having glaucoma with mild damage, that is, optic disc cupping is there, but uh, no visual loss is there, then the reduction of 20 to 30% from baseline is safe. In glaucoma patients, <coughs> sorry, in glaucoma patients with advanced damage, reduction of 40% or more from the baseline is required. In normal tension glaucoma, uh, reduction of 30% from baseline is, uh, is sufficient, while in ocular hypertension, reduction of 20% from baseline is required. This is debatable. So an, in an open angle glaucoma with IOP in the mid to high 20s, uh, the target IOP sh range should, should be 14 to 17 millimeters of mercury. In advanced glaucoma, the target uh, IOP should be less than 15 millimeters of mercury. In ocular hypertensives, who, uh, ocular hypertensives whose IOP is more than 30 millimeters of mercury with no signs of optic damage, the target IOP should be less than 20 millimeters of mercury. So target IOP in clinical practice, uh, it includes a percentage or absolute amount of pressure reduction in a predetermined IOP figure or range. The target pressure should be individualized at the diagnosis and may need adjustment during the course of disease at further, uh, we keep on doing the uh, fields and all. And regarding, uh, on the basis of that, we can change the target pressure also. How to set the target pressure in clinical practice? It should be a threshold of absolute cutoff value, percentage rejection, and formula-based values. So in, uh, if the uh, clinically, how to uh, apply this target pressure? In early glaucoma, it can be from 15 to 17 millimeters of mercury. In moderate, 12 to 15. And in severe glaucoma, 10 to 12 millimeters of mercury. So uh, just to sum it up, if the glaucomatous damage is early, then you can have a higher target IOP. If it is advanced, then you have to keep the IOP, target IOP low. If the life expectancy is short, then a uh, higher target IOP can be um, I mean managed. If it is long, then you have to think about going to a lower target IOP. If there's untreated IOP is high, then you can keep the IOP on the target IOP on the higher side. But if the untreated IOP is low, then that needs to be reduced further. If uh, the rate of progression is slow, we can have a higher target IOP, but if it is fast, then you need to tend it lower down. The stage of damage in IOP level are the most important drivers for target pressure related clinical decision making to prevent blindness. Thank you. Thank you, Navindu. <coughs> now I'll invite Dr. Chandrima Paul. Dr. Chandrima Paul is director of BBI Hospital and she is secretary of GSI. And she'll be talking to us about uh, anterior chamber uh, gonoscopy and uh, UBM. So she will relate the gonioscopy with the UBM. It's important for everybody to know that when gonioscopy is, gonioscopy is for everybody, but UVM is not for everybody. So she will, she'll tell you all these factors. She's got huge amount of experience. So here you can take some clinical pearls, which you will use in life and not really for the exam only. Nabendu gave you lots of points for MCQs. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Madhu ma'am, for those kind words. And uh, okay, so I'll just give you a few uh, very practical points which you need to know uh, for gonioscopy and UVM. 
So angle closure glaucoma, it's actually the major form of glaucoma. And we know that from the prevalence studies which have been done across the country. It's almost a 50-50 ratio. Early detection is of paramount importance as the laser peripheral iridotomy has potential to alter the natural history of the disease. And it is a disease with a much higher visual morbidity than primary open angle glaucoma. Anterior cham chamber angle assessment remains the key to manage this condition effectively. So gonioscopy. Gonioscopy remains the current reference standard. It's a subjective assessment. It, there is an inter-observer variability and different lenses can be used that can alter angle appearance and affect interpretation. Objective angle assessment can be done with the ultrasound biomicroscopy or the UBM, the anterior segment OCT, the Sheb flood photography, objective methods are yet to replace gonioscopy for angle assessment and that is the full and final statement. Gonioscopy is the gold standard for angle assessment. So a picture is worth a thousand words and it is never as true anywhere else except in gonioscopy. So you actually see a lot of things there. And this is a very uh, prime picture because if you just have this picture in front of you in the slit lamp, you have actually seen the angle. What you need to see is actually the trabecular meshwork to call an angle open. So the different type of gonial lenses, I'll just run through them. You can use a single mirror lens if you're comfortable with that, but you can't do indentation gonioscopy with it. You can use a double mirror lens, you can use a triple mirror lens, but all these lenses would only show you the angle, but you can't do an indentation gonioscopy. So I suggest that you start with the four mirror lens because with that you can also do the indentation gonioscopy. The four mirror lens is comfortable. You just need to move your joystick. You don't need to rotate the lens. Uh, the sm a small learning curve, but you can actually do everything with that. You can do indentation and you can see your angles as well. The uh, Zeiss or the Sussman, whichever you have, is good enough. So when to do gonioscopy? The Van Herrick's test. You start with the Van Herrick's test, but let me tell you this. If the Van Herrick shows you a narrow angle, you definitely have a narrow angle. But if the Van Herrick shows you a not so narrow angle, you still might have a narrow angle. So you cannot actually override gonioscopy. You have to do gonioscopy. Intraocular pressure more than 22 millimeters of mercury, disc suspicious, signs of previous angle closure like splinter spiraling or glaucoma flecken, and of course CRVO and BRVO for which you have to do gonioscopy. So how to do gonioscopy? The ideal conditions for doing a gonioscopy are a short beam of light, say about one millimeter, avoid illuminating the pupil, and a dark room is essential to manipulate, ask the patient to look into the direction of the mirror or to indent the cornea with a four mirror and uh, see the decimus folds to see whether there is pass or not. Or it's a, just a, a, a positional angle closure. So the view in it, what we do is actually the indirect gonioscopy at the slit lamp and the angle is viewed in 180 degrees away over the hill view in convex iris, dive bomber view, that is patient looking in the direction of the mirror more deep angle recesses can be seen in that and tangential view of the trabecular meshwork is possible. And uh, cruise missile view, that is where the patient is to look away from the mirror and uh, view obtained parallel to the iris, perpendicular to the trabecular meshwork and that's the optimal image quality. So if you look at that, how would you do gonioscopy? So uh, the best way to do gonioscopy is the corneal wedge technique, which uses the slit lamp to create two visible lines that come together at the patient's shawl base line, making the line easier to identify. So just look here. So that's the corneal wedge. They meet here at the shawl base line. And immediately after that, you identify the trabecular meshwork. And once you identify the trabecular meshwork, it's very simple to see the scleral spur. I don't know whether you can see my pointer. Yeah, the scleral spur and finally the ciliary body and the rest of it. So that's the easiest way to do gonioscopy. Form your corneal wedge and then make the, make the two meet at the apex and immediately identify the shawl base line. Following that is the trabecular meshwork. Following that is the scleral spur and then finally the uh, ciliary body. Indentation gonioscopy. That is, I told you with the four mirror, if there's a, a positional angle closure, then the angle as is closed here would open on pressure. And if it's a cynical closure, it would not open on pressure. So that is, uh, just to tell you a little bit about the different structures that you see in gonioscopy. Uh, if you look at that, the ciliary body, we start right from uh, 
here. That's an open angle that you're looking at. So the ciliary body is one of the most easily notable structures. You cannot actually miss that. And it varies in color from grayish to brownish. The scleral spur, this is one of the most important things and is simply a wedge of visible sclera and is the second structure to disappear as the angle narrows. Trabecular meshwork, we have two parts of it. You have the pigmented trabecular meshwork and the, the anterior one which is non-pigmented and the posterior one which is pigmented. And if you see the trabecular meshwork, you can grade that angle as open. If you do not see the trabecular meshwork, then it's a closed angle. It's as simple as that. Then you have the Schalbez line, which I just spoke to you about in detail. And finally, you have the Schlems canal, which is usually not visible, but sometimes there can be uh, blood in the Schlems canal as well, and you can see it. So that's an uh, open angle, the corneal wedge, and the structures as you see it, what I told you, I'm sure you'll be able to identify it now after a few attempts at gonioscopia. And that's a totally closed angle where you actually do not see any structures. Grading the angle. Grading the angle, actually, we have three systems of grading. And uh, they are the Sheffer system, the Shi system, the space system. There's also the Mother Mohan system. But we generally, for simplicity, follow the Sheffer system. Sheffer system of grading, as you see out here, is very, very simple. That's grade four, a completely open angle. And then you have, if you see it here, it's about 45 to 30 degrees. And then you have grade three, which is about, say, 30 to 20 degrees, followed by grade two and grade one, where the angle is closed. So this is the Sampolesis line, which is pigment deposition anterior to the Scholves line that you see out there. And uh, this is this actually you can see in exfoliative syndrome. Then comes the peripheral anterior synechia. That's how you could see it on gonioscopy. And this is angle recession that you see. Now to uh, actually uh, diagnose angle recession, what you need to note is the normal angle with the narrow ciliary body. And look at this. This is the normal angle that you see out there. That point that you see out there, that is where the recession starts, the arrow, arrowhead. And as you go up out there, just look at that. The ciliary body actually has a different kind of subsequent segments are actually um, thicker and thinner as they go on. So that is ang angle recession that you see out there. And uh, that you need to diagnose. Here's another picture of angle recession that you see. Neovascular glaucoma, well, uh, as you all know, that diabetic retinopathy, one of the earliest signs is angle neovascularization. That's rubiosis that you see out there, and that is angle neovascularization that you see. So plateau iris, just uh, coming to the end of gonioscopy before I start UBM, plateau iris, that would take you to UBM, because plateau iris is something which you see at the UBM. Gonioscopy is not of very much help, though of course the sine wave sign that you see out here is pathognomonic of a plateau iris, but uh, so many a time you cannot actually see it on gonioscopy. So we move on to UBM. So examination technique, patient is, the patient is examined in the supine position under topical anesthesia and a specially designed eye cup as you see out there holding, used for the water bath. The bath is filled with coupling fluid, either normal saline or methyl cellulose, and the transducer with an oscillating probe is introduced into the bath and its direction is manipulated to obtain images of the required structure on the screen. So the angle of the anterior chamber to study the, uh, why, uh, what for it is used to study the angle closure. You can have a cross-sectional view of the angle is obtained. UBM is mainly used for basically qualitative analysis. And confirmation of the appositional angle closure, ciliary rotation can be seen, ciliary body and other abnormalities can be seen, and uh, corneoscleral junction and scleral spur are identified in most eyes. So let's have a look at this. That's the linear distance of geometric angle that you see out there here the angle measurements that you can get, area between the iris and the trabecular meshwork, iris thickness and contour, and relationship between iris and ciliary body. And that's the normal uh, angle that you see in the UBM. So these are the parameters uh, as proposed by Pablin and Foster that actually give you the angle opening distance, the trabecular meshwork to iris. All this actually, I put it up that is important for you to know for your exams, but I don't think I need to go through this here because you would get it in any uh, internet uh, chapter or a textbook. Next, we move on to primary angle closure glaucoma, where if you see a pupillary block opening, opening up of the angle after peripheral uh, iridotomy, you see there, look at this, and then look at this. That's after the uh, laser PI has been done and can clearly be seen in the UBM. In non-pupillary block glaucoma, where the anterior rotation of the ciliary body is the cause of angle closure. Sorry. So there, if you look at this, look at this here. And look at this here. Even after peripheral iridotomy, it does not actually improve. So that is what we call the plateau iris. 
and you know what is the plateau iris syndrome and what is the plateau iris configuration. So go on to the darkroom provocative test. Gonos gonioscopy is challenging due to requirement of illumination and inadvertent manipulation. UBM less manipulation can be performed in the darkroom. So that's where you can use the UBM. Peripheral anterior sinecure. Uh, gonioscopic features of the angle, two types, that is the B type and the S type that you have. Pigment dispersion syndrome, the angle is wide with a concave iris and uh, you can see the iridal lenticular contact that is there. Secondary angle closure, secondary to iris abnormalities, these are the things where UVM is useful. Secondary to lens subluxation, neovascular glaucoma, iridocorneal endothelial syndrome, pigment dispersion syndrome and malignant glaucoma. So neovascular glaucoma, atrophy of the iris stroma, you can see and uh, anterior sinecure contraction of the fibrovascular membranes that you see. Malignant glaucoma, blockage of the aqueous flow at the level of the ciliary body or anterior vitreous phase. So aqueous humor is misdirected into the vitreous as you can see out there, the UBM picture that is the anterior displacement of the uh, iris root that you see out there and uh, the uniformly shallow uh, uh, anterior chamber that you see, the vitreous cavity expands increasing the posterior segment pressure and therefore the lens iris diaphragm is pushed forward. In congenital glaucoma, so absence of pleural spur, thin iris and loss of stromal elasticity and peripheral iris adherent to cornea. So in conclusion, the UVM and anterior OCT provide real-time cross-sectional images of the anterior chamber angle, accuracy and reproducibility yet to be proved. Gonioscopy remains and continues to be the essential tool for assessment of the angle in diagnosing glaucoma. And I'd like to leave you with the message that please do not diagnose glaucoma or write any anti-glaucoma medication without doing a gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is a must for diagnosing glaucoma. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shandrima. It's a very lucid presentation. You brought out absolutely crux points. Kids, just keep all these points in your mind. I know it must be loaded since morning, but still there are pearls in it and life's experience. Now I'll request Dr. Manoj Mathur. Dr. Manoj Mathur is a, a senior glaucoma surgeon and he's a director of Sarup Eye Hospital. And he shall be talking to you about the optic nerve head rather optic disc evaluation if we uh, put in your language. So, there seems to be some murmur among the students, what's on? Tired? Some questions? Something more entertaining? Too much of toxicity? Yes? Okay, just wait for two more talks. I'll have something interactive for you. Right? So you will speak, I'll listen to you. Right? Okay, so now let's go with Dr. Manoj Mathur. So thank you, Dr. Bhaduria, for that kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. So I, with my presentation, I am trying to make it more clinical for you. So <coughs> hope you like it. So at the outset, let us consider the anatomical basis, structural defect and functional mapping. Always when you see the center of the retina, it is marked as the fovea, and that is reflected in the center of the field. Whereas the optic nerve, which is slightly nasal, is represented in the temp slightly in the temporal segment of the visual field, whereas any defect on the temporal retina naturally gets reflected into the nasal stem. So if you see this slide here, any defect, you they see the nerve fibers, they are run in an arcuate fashion. If there is a small defect here, it can form a focal defect, or if there is a larger defect, it can form a focal defect here. So this is the concept of a the glaucomatous focal defect on the visual field. Whereas if you see here, entire at the edge of the optic disc, if there is an injury or a uh, damage, the entire arcuate fiber gets affected, and this is the typical nasal step that is formed in glaucoma. So if there is a horizontal demarcation, it is classical of glaucoma. If there is a vertical demarcation in the visual field, it is classical of neuro uh, neurological disorders. And if there is no demarcation, there can be a local cause, as I showed you in the first slide. So now, whenever you are trying to do a disc evaluation, 
this is the right way to do with either a uh, 78D or a 90D lens or a 60D lens, indirect uh, disk evaluation is the way to go and not the direct ophthalmoscopy because it doesn't afford the stereoscopic uh, view with the direct ophthalmoscope. So what are the parameters that you should look out for the moment you look at the optic disk? Number one, the most important as on today, I would say, is the optic disk size. You have to make a forced decision as to what is the size of the disk that you're looking, whether it is a small disk or a normal size disk or a large disk. I'll come to this SPU slides later. Then the standard optic cup, the neuroretinal ring, which is the prime of prime importance, which is absolutely important to assess the health of the neuroretinal ring at the end of the day. Any vascular changes or any hemorrhage on the optic disk. Hemorrhage will not look at you. You have to see and rule out an optic disc hemorrhage. Any nerve fiber layer defect, and last but not the least, peripapillary atrophy or a chorioretinal degeneration. So let us move on. The optic disc size. If you see the spot size of a ophthalmoscope, direct ophthalmoscope here, you see the size of the disc is supposed to be a standard about 1.5 millimeter diameter. Here you look at is a small disc, whereas the same spot size here, here what you see is a large optic disc, and you know that 1.2 million axons pass through the neuroretinal rim. The com next comes the optic cup. The optic cup disc ratio is a standard. The vertical cup disc ratio is more important. You need to see how much is the cup disc ratio in a vertical uh, manner, and then any cup disc asymmetry uh, you need to evaluate. And then the next thing comes the anisometropia. What is the size, again, between the two eyes, a larger disc in one eye compared to the smaller one in the other eye. Now, the relation, as I showed you, how does optic disc size and the cup disc ratio correlate? If you see this normal disc here, you see this is a normal size disc and about 1.2 million axons pass through the optic disc. Now you see this, this is also a normal disc, it's a normal disc of about normal size, and again you know the 1.2 million axons are passing. And here if you see, it is a large disc, this is also a normal disc, and you know that 1.2 million axons are passing through the optic nerve head or, or the neuroretinal ring. If you see all the three discs together, what is the lesson that we learn? that the cup disc ratio varies with the size of the disc. These are all the three are normal discs. This is a small disc, this is a medium sized disc, and this is a large disc. So cup disc ratio on its own is not significant. Then large cup can be normal for a large disc, whereas a small cup can be abnormal for a small disc. So importance of varies with the disc size. That is the reason why the moment you look at the optic disc, make a forced decision whether you are looking at a small disc or a normal size disc or a large disc. And then you have to correlate it with the optic cup and what stands out is that the, it is only a surrogate for the neuroretinal rim. This correlation between the size of the disc and the optic disc cup is a surrogate for the neuroretinal rim. So what is important is the health of the neuroretinal rim through which, this is the neuroretinal rim through which 1.2 million axons pass. Whether it is pink, whether it is pale, whether does it have a focal abnormality like a notch. The next thing important is the so-called isn't rule. Isn't rule means the inferior neuroretinal rim is supposed to be thicker than the superior neuroretinal rim, which is supposed to be slightly thicker than the nasal and the temporal. This is the typical isn't rule. If the isn't rule is obeyed, caveat here, the disc should be straight, the disc should not be tilted. In certain abnormal situations, isn't rule is not applicable. But as a whole, in a normal disc, whenever you're looking at it, if the inferior isn't rule is not obeyed, that can lead to a suspicion of glaucoma. Then the contour versus color cupping. If you see this, if I ask you what is the cupping in this, you might say this is the amount of cupping 0.6. But if you see the dipping of the vessel here, this is the contour cup. So the difference between the color cupping and the contour cupping, you need to make a decision. If you see the dipping of the vessel, the bionating of the vessel, the, dip, the, it, the contour cup is almost near total, about 0.9 cup, which may not correlate with the color cupping. Color cupping can be less, but you need to see the vasculature, assess the vasculature, where the vessels are dipping, and get to know about the contour cup to come to a conclusion as to structurally what is the level of optic disc cupping. 
Then the vascular changes, the standard nasal shifting of the vessel, the bearing of the vessels. Once the, you, there is a loss or apoptosis of the neuroretinal ring fibers, there can be bearing of the vessels and bayoneting of the vessels where the vessels dip, take a sharp turn and dip into the cup. <coughs> the hemorrhages, as I said, always try to look out for hemorrhages and rule out the presence of hemorrhages rather than the hemorrhage trying to uh, look on to you. Uh, Next comes the nerve fiber layer defect. Generally, it is seen with the red free light. If you see the texture, the glistening retinal nerve for the fiber, the glistening thing that is that it is lost. What I always say is the moment you have a look at the optic disc, you do a parikram around the disc. The moment you see a loss of texture at the edge of the disc, try to look out and fan out into the periphery and only then you will be able to make out the nerve fiber layer defect. It is very, very unlikely and it is near impossible that in a normal 90D examination without a red free light to pick up a nerve fiber layer defect unless you see it carefully with the red free light. So if you see the nerve fiber layer defect here, it is like a dark wedge. It is touching the disc. You see a hemorrhage here, the disc is touching the, and then it fans out into the periphery. And as I said earlier, if you see the glistening texture all around the disc, here the texture is missing. From here you look out into the periphery, then it is that, that point that you uh, try to uh, understand this concept of no fiber layer defect carefully. If you see the color image here and the red free light here, it is very difficult to pick up this nerve fiber layer defect unless it is a red free light. Or you go around the disc carefully. If you see there is a loss of glistening te texture here, then you go out into the periphery, fan out into the periphery, then probably you may be able to pick up the nerve fiber layer defect. The next thing is the peripapillary atrophy or the corioretinal degeneration. What is this peripapillary atrophy? If you see generally, it is the central beta zone. Th this is the beta peripapillary zone, and then this is the alpha zone. It is, there are two types, and th this is very rare seen nasally or circumferential. This is generally seen, peripapillary atrophy is on the temporal side. The one closer to the disc is the beta, and the in the periphery is the alpha. If you see the alpha zone, it is peripheral to beta. This is the alpha zone. It is peripheral to the beta. And then irregular hyper and hyperpigmentation can be seen in this zone. It is because of thinning of the retinal pigment epithelium. And this can give you a relative scotoma in the visual field. Whereas if you see the beta zone, beta zone is central to the alpha and it is peripheral to the disc margin. It, it is known by, it is because of marred atrophy of the RPE and there can be visible choroidal vessels and sclera can be visible. And naturally when there is no RPE, literally no RPE, it results in absolute scotoma. Then the last but not the least is the chorioretinal degeneration. Chorioretinal degeneration is not pathognomonic of glaucoma, but chorioretinal degeneration has the potential of suppressing the sensitivity of the glaucoma there in the visual field. There can be a diffuse suppression of sensitivity in the visual field. So these are the seven things basically. The moment you look at the optic disc, make a forced decision whether you're looking at a small disc or a normal size disc or a large disc, Correlate it with the optic cup. What stands out is the neuroretinal rim. The health of the neuroretinal rim, whether it is pink, pale, or have, does have a local abnormality like a notch, whether the isn't rule is being followed or not. Then comes the vascular changes. After vascular changes, rule out the presence of hemorrhage. And after that, look out for temporal crescent, alpha zone and the beta zone. And last but not the least, Look out for chorioretinal degeneration, and this completes your examination of the optic clinic, a clinical uh, evaluation of the optic disc. The important concept is the JOS rules that you must all know. What the JOS rules say, until proved otherwise, all discs have glaucoma testing, and just look out for glaucoma. Glaucoma will not stare at you. All glaucomas have RNFL defect. Look out carefully. Make a parikrama around the disc. The moment you see a loss of glistening texture, try to fan out into the periphery and diagnose a retinal nerve fiber defect. If possible, 
but it is very difficult to see in the normal, uh, the, in the, the, but in the red field, with the red field light, you have a better chance of identifying. Then all glaucomas have disc hemorrhage. As I said, look out and rule out disc hemorrhage rather than the disc hemorrhage staring at you. And last but not the least, all myops have glaucoma. Every myop, suspect glaucoma, rule out glaucoma in all myops. These are the JAWS rules. And now let us see the structural and functional correlation, what all we have discussed about the optic disc evaluation. If you see this optic disc here, the size of the disc, as I said, the first decision that you need to make, here you see a large disc. The cupping is almost 0.7. The neuroretinal rim is pink. It is not, there is no focal abnormality, and it is symmetrical. It is likely to be normal. So a nor this disc, three to four decades back was glaucoma, which is not the case now. Now, if you see here, this is a normal size disc. Is the inferior, if you see here, there is a notch here, the inferior neuroretinal rim is thinner than the superior neuroretinal rim, and because of this notch, there is an early focal glaucomatous defect in the visual field in the superior nasal step. This is the way you must see, and if you see here, this is the color cupping, but if you see the dipping of the vessel here, the dipping of the vessel here, the cupping is more, more in the inferior segment because there is the ESIM tool is definitely not obeyed. There is a definite excavation of the inferior neuroretinal rim and that manifests as a dense superior arcuate defect. If you see this disc here, near total cupping, it manifests as a total suppression of, uh, in the visual field. In such cases, do a central 10-2 program for follow-up for these patients. I'm completing, and this is the last slide. The chorioretinal degeneration, as I said, caveat here, it can be a cataract, but if, assuming that there is no cataract here, chorioretinal degeneration can give rise to a diffuse suppression of sensitivity in the visual field. If you see a temporal pallor, always bilateral temporal pallor, do the visual field, you won't be amused if you see a homonymous hemianopia. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mathur, for that very informative talk. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Kitti Singh. Disc evaluation is actually the cornerstone of glaucoma diagnosis. So it's very important that you recognize the glaucomatous changes while evaluating the optic disc. Dr. Uh, Kitty Singh will be speaking to us on nerve fiber layer analysis in glaucoma, tips and uh, tricks. It's the OCT RMS, uh, yeah. That yeah, nerve fiber Dr. layer Sandra analysis, said. yeah. Yeah, so it Same was thing. because I said specifically where also, he said okay then. <laughs> Can we just put that on? So at the outset, I'm thankful to the organizers and the team of iShadow for having me here. And So we're going to talk about the nerve fiber analysis in glaucoma. And again, I took the uh, mandate to talk about the OCT primarily. Now, I have no financial interest to declare because I am not in the line of Michelson or David Huang, who were amazing enough to give us this machine. OCT has evolved, as you have known, since, since the last two decades. It's really evolved very rapidly, you know, from the time domain to the spectral domain to the swept source and even further to the extended depth imaging to the diamond rosa and the biomechanics and the angiography. So, uh, yeah, you can take pictures of this because this is a very common... Uh, in fact, anybody of you, all the students, I mean, this is not intended to, but if you want to really read about this, the DGO issue of January, it's online, it has all these things in it, okay? So the spectral domain, which we commonly have, and the one which I have the most experience with, has the Fourier domain, so that's important for you to know because the Fourier domain gives you the 3D picture more detailed, and it's a very increased resolution of five microns and the faster speed. Not only to remember the figures, 
But there are two strategies of that, which I'll come to, and it has an advanced algorithm, segmentation algorithm which details the macular GCC and the GCIPL, which was not there in the time domain. And the retinal vessel tracking increases the interscan irreducibility. Now the new one on the new baby on the block is this web source OCT and the OCT angiography. It has a much longer wavelength of 1060 nanometers. And as I was talking about the extended depth imaging, the new aspects of lamina cribrosa biomechanics are coming up because of this, because it can visualize to the supraglottal space. And it overcomes the scattering by the RP. So come to those two strategies. So that's just a brief overview of what all is available in OCT. And the strategies are two primarily. The one which we rely on most commonly is the optic disc cube or the circumpapillary RNFL and the macular cube, which is called as the macular GCIPL. Okay, so coming to the first one, it's a six millimeter, six millimeter area optic disc cube. And if the information is from a circle of 3.46 millimeters, if it's an MCQ, you need to know this, that the area is six, six millimeters squared, but the diameter is 3.46. And this is very important to know because Dr. Manoj was just talking about the alpha gamma zone, the alpha beta zone, there's a new terminology called as the gamma zone. And that comes up from the OCT because OCT determines the op optic disc edge from the Brooks membrane terminations. So remember your choroid anatomy is a Brooks membrane. And the minimum bad width distance is the shortest purple dis purple distance. Why is it important clinically? Is I'm not giving just few figures. These are important to understand because these are going to define your optic disc parameters. Okay, so we are familiar with this map, and we this is the second one, the macular GCC, and it has it has a three layers of the ganglion cells. Okay, the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is the axons, the ganglion cell layer, which is the cell body, and the inner plexiform layer or the IPL, which is the cell dendrite. So all three comprise the ganglion cell complex or GCC, and now the new algorithms have the GCIPL, just removing the nerve fiber layers, okay? Why macula? Remember your anatomy, basically, because the macula has the maximum density of retinal ganglion cells, over 50%, multi-layer, seven layers. Therefore, this is less likely to reach floor effect. Keep this in mind, I'll come to floor effect later on. However, in patients, like Dr. Mathur was saying, myopes, where discs are so abnormal or discs are so different than are the Gaussian curve, the parameters don't really fit in for the normal database to apply. So optic disc anomalies and myopes and macular GCC is the better option. Okay, so remember this, macular GCC and the GCIPL. Clear so far? Any questions, you can stop. Okay, so the macular cube also is six millimeter square. Okay, and it is an element of the GCC algorithms, and it is defined as the boundaries, the outer boundaries. So, the outer boundaries, and this is the inner boundary. Okay, and again, it has a quadrant map. There are six quadrant maps: superior, inferior, supranasal, supratemporal, infranasal, infratemporal. Okay, why is the center white must? Because fovea per se lacks ganglion cells, therefore it has a mask. Okay, again, a viva question, which is asked: Why is the fovea must? Okay, so macular GCC as, however, obviously it cannot be done in macular pathologies like edema or attraction or hole, and it is query said to be superior to serpentine RNFL. However, that's not really confirmed because many studies have said that RNFL is still better. If we get the latest this study of a of almost 34 studies uh, meta analysis, which said that CPR RNFL is better in the long run with a 13-year follow-up of patients. However, some authors say no, and uh, normal tension glaucoma people sometimes refer to do macular GCC. So you have two options. You talk about the two options. Let's talk about the printout. This is what you'll get in the viva in the exams for the, you get this. So you should know how to read that. First one obviously is the patient data and strength, just like vi visual field, you have to have the correct patient name. Signal strength is important because that's a quality control measure and many machines have a different area, but us different figure. Usually it's seven to eight. So less than that signal strength means either it's a media opacity or poor fixation or operator error. You should not take that into account in that, that uh, printout. Poor signal strength is usually a PCO, ocular surface dry eyes. Now dry eyes is extremely common in glaucoma patients. So put a lubricant drop if you are getting poor signal strength repeatedly, ask the patient to blink and then try to do the OCT again. Then we come to the raw data. Now here again, there are two trick questions, which is color code A and which is color code B. Any idea anybody wants to 
have heard this thing. Okay, there's time is short, so I'll just come to it. So this is the only map, the raw data, the number three one, number two one is the, the number three one is the only one which without any relation to the normative database. Okay. So this is color code A. If you remember it, the red is a good boy. Okay. So that means warm and thick colors. Warm is thick, gold is thin. So better thick thick RNFL is good and thin RNFL obviously is bad. Okay. Black means if there's a color coming up as black, which means this cannot be scanned. Okay. So remember this color code of color code A, okay? Then we have the new, and this is the color code A's without any normative database. Then we have the NR thick block, okay? This is the number four is the neuroretinal rim thickness plot. It is compared with the age and disk size matched normative database, okay? And this follows the DISNET configuration. This is the RNL deviation map, the number five one, okay? Any region not red or yellow is with the normal limits, okay? And the three circles superimposed on each other, black is the BMO circle. Remember I talked in the first, second slide, BMO is Brooks membrane opening distance, and the OCT um, takes it as the BMO, wherever it stops, that is the optic disc margin, okay? Red circle is the cup border, and the purple circle is the calculation border, okay? Clear so far? So that is where the BMO is important and the minimal band width is important, okay? This is the nerve retinal fiber layer thickness which will measure from here and that is how it will measure. So these are the machine algorithms which you have to know to interpret it properly, okay? Then the next sixth one is the RNFL TISNET plot. Again, it's a foundation of RNFL. This is the one which we, our eyes spontaneously go here to the double hump pattern. We know why the double hump pattern is there because the inferior and superior uh, the nerve fibers are thickest, okay? And this uses, as I said, 3.46 millimeter calculation circle, okay? Then we have the RNFL quadrant and clock hours. That's not so important. And the extracted vertical and horizontal tomographs for the cup uh, configuration and artifacts and color code B, C is based on reflectance. And this is the raw image, okay? So, uh, I think we missed the color code B. In, uh, B A is the one in which the red is bad, okay? That is a reflectance. I think we missed that in between somewhere. Yeah, here it is color code B where the red is the bad boy. And this uh, yeah, red in 1% and the other one here, the red is the good boy. Remember that color code A and B. Okay, so B is first and A is afterwards. Then we come to the, what is the other parameters which you should remember is that age. And that again, the machine incorporates that, the age normative database, but however, you should know that with age, even normally non-glaucometers people also would lose nerve fiber layers, okay? And it's most commonly there in the superior quadrant. The other thing which is important for us sitting here in this, con in this country is that most of these databases are from Caucasian eyes and sometimes from the ethnic, from the, uh, Chinese eyes, yeah, none of them are from Indian eyes, and we do know that eyes are, our eyes are different from the others. So average Indian RNFL is, uh, is thinner than the Caucasian. So keep that into account before you label anybody as a rare disease, because it is not geared up to our database. Okay, so remember this figure that it's for either for Caucasian or for, H or for Chinese. How do you interpret the, mac the macular scan? Again, the same way, data strength, thickness map, deviation map, sector map, thickness table. So let's come to one the one. Again, thickness map, the warm colors, the red, the red is a better boy, okay? It is a raw, not related to the normative database, it's color code A, okay? Then the deviation map is color code B, where the red is the bad boy, okay? So not, uh, so, so not red and yellow is normal, so the red is the thinner ones, okay? And uh, this again, the, we just talked about the mast area and the fovea. Then we have the GCC maps, okay? So you can see the GCC maps, the thickness map, the deviation map, and the significance map. They would have the color code A. What are the fallacies? We talked about the floor effect. Remember that the RNFL thickness has the lesser, uh, has a floor effect, whereas macular GCC, because it has eight to nine less layers, it would not have a floor effect. However, that's not really true because of different things. RNFL thickness would not drop less than 40 microns. Why? Because some glial tissue and vascular tissue remains. Even if all the RNFL were to be wiped out, even then you would have at least 40 microns. Okay, in those situations you go for the GCC macula because it has a less of a floor effect. Other thing you do in advanced glaucoma, the next question would be what else would you do? You would do a macular threshold or a 10-2 strategy. 
However, there are some fallacies. Okay, in this study from PGI I talked about this, that the macular cells have primarily, the macula has primarily P cells, the smaller P cells, and the larger M cells are the one which are destroyed in glaucoma. So the really about the floor effect thing and the macular thing, they have actually refuted it that it's not really that significant. But usual literature says, the common literature says that the floor effect is less seen in the macula tissue, macula map. This is the pano map. If you reach this level, that means you are going for a grand viva or distinction viva because you've crossed the main ones. So this is the pano map, which you have opted this cube and the macular cube both superimposed. Okay, you have a combined pano map which has macular GCC and peripapillary RNFL, and this is something which very few centers would have a hood report which has the both the macular GCC and the RNFL along with superimposed with the visual field test locations. It's overlapped. And this picture was not mine, this was Dr. Dada's picture, courtesy. The last one would be about the errors. No machine, no human being is without errors, no machine without errors. That is why the whole growth is there. So there's something called as red and green disease. Please remember this study. When we talk so much about OCT and we, you know, point blank, we see a red sector and we start medications. Very often I see patients on two medications, ki OCT kharaab hai. Nobody has really seen the disc that well and nobody has really done the visual field that well and no one has done the gonioscopy. But they started one, two medicines just on the red aspect. So talk about the red disease. 46% of scans and the good quality scans may have errors. So read every scan with clinical correlation with the patient. The errors are three types, acquisition related, which is motion artifact, which is the most common, then the blink, media opacities, blinking, ocular surface disease as dry eyes. Operator dependent are the positioning and the machine related errors. So the three types are patient, operator, and machine dependent. Again, machine, we talked about the normative database and the artifacts could be due to pathology of the disc or the anatomical variations like disc abnormalities and we just talked about the peripapillary atrophy, high myopia, split, or shifted RNFL and red and green disease. Let's come to them one by one rapidly. Patient dependent, motion artifacts, you all know about that. You'll have black circles or there'll be break. Signal strength will be poor, okay? And this is very common in media opacities and the blinking. During scan acquisition, you'll have dark bands on the reflectance image, you can see those. Okay, so these bands will show that this is a, this has a patient motion artifacts. Then you would do artificial tears, avoid an airdrop. Whenever you have an OCT machine in an AC room, try to make the patient positioning such that the AC doesn't come in the patient's eye so that you'll avoid this dryness. And this study showed that actually how significant a lens capacity would change the OCT because just after phaco emulsification, the average RNFL increased drastically almost by 10 microns, okay? Look for break in blood vessels to rule out any at any motion artifacts. This break in blood vessel, okay? So these are very fine things you have to just look for, okay? Breaks in blood vessel. Operator dependent are the marking of the BMO. Now it is not so important because now the inbuilt algorithms will do it for you, okay? Red disease means false diagnosis or wrong diagnosis, anxiety of the patient, so please avoid treating a red disease. Green disease means false negative, complacency when actually there's a disease. So what are these? The segmentation errors, like this is a patient with epi anterior ep error is epiretinal membrane. If it is pulling up the RNFL, it'll cause an artifactual increase in RNFL and that'll cause a green disease, okay? Posterior error is high myopia or staphyloma. If it is larger the eyeball, staphyloma, it is pushed back and that will show as a red disease. Okay, incomplete would be vitreous opacity and PVD. Disc morphology, again, there's so much of variation. In this. We talked about the alpha, beta, remember? Uh, large cups and small cups, there's so much variation. So the circle is 3.6, uh, it will be beyond that and it will cover the beta zones. So once the, sec the circle is covering the beta zone, it is artifactually picking up a wider area and it is showing it as a thinner RNFL. Myopia, there's an article again in the uh, DGO about this. There's a temporal displacement of retinal ganglion cells, okay, and their magnification, magnification error, errors, which will cause difficulty in locating the BMO and absence of a normative database beyond more less than more less than minus 22 and more than plus six. So these are the errors which you have, the magnification errors, you have to have a Littmann circle here, 
and you have the issues of the BMO location. So remember, myopia, glaucoma is very common, but myopia OCT has errors, okay? Then shift, these are the shifted RNFL peaks will show up as a localized dip, but it's actually shifted. This came up in the GDX machine. It showed us that there is segmentation of the RNFL vis-a-vis -vis shifted RNFL peaks. They're two different things. Shifted RNFL peaks are just an anomaly, anatomical, whereas temporal displacement of the peak is there in myopia. And if, uh, for if all of you who are interested in reading about this myopia, this article is there on the site. Yeah. So myopia, this last two slides on the DIG study, this is a new study which has come up, which was talks about the diagnostic innovations in glaucoma study that talks about the reference database of healthy myopes, and that talks about the gamma zone where the BMO is missing. And gamma zone is not that linked with glaucoma as is with beta zone. Okay, peripapillary atrophy we've covered. Split RNFL, I just told you it's a defect which is seen and Wise ring is again, PVD is very common. It can cause a localized red disease if it blocks the signal, okay? But it can also cause a green disease if it causes PVD and artifactually pick, pulls up the RNFL. So again, the message goes is clinically please do correlate. And this is what Dr. Mathur was probably saying. The red free filter, this is a very interesting feature in the slit lamp, do that. Try to see nerve fibers with the red free then try to see the fundus picture and you will start picking up nerve fiber defects, okay? So these are the latest studies on the new machines with the NFAS structure analysis of the blood vessels and the OCT. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirti, for that uh, very informative talk. Uh, next, we move on to none other than Dr. Madhu Badoria. We always reserve the best for the last and she's going to speak to you on glaucomatous visual field. That's going to be an interactive session. So first and foremost, I'm not speaking. You are speaking, I know hard disks are full. And if anything more than this, they'll hang, right? So I'll have something which is uh, where you will talk. I will just give you the reasons to talk and then, then you will be talking about it, right? So let's start with the stage is set by Dr. Mathur. This won't change. And it's all right. <coughs> so now I've made you all of the knowledge. I've passed you all, right? Now a patient comes to your clinic, sent by some doctor, and he comes with visual field. Now, will you make a diagnosis like Kirti said, they come on OCT, they're being treated. So will you treat it on visual field, or you'll want to do something else? It's your turn. Santosh asked me to make this class totally interactive. You will answer. I am a patient. I have come with visual fields of right and left eye. I have come to the clinic. Now, what are you going to do? <laughs> Clinical examination. Very good. So what all will you do in that? <laughs> ha, Clinical examination, Bola, to that covers everything. You've done the clinical examination. Now, you found something somewhere. So what all, what all is it that you are dying to connect with visual field? Manoj said that. Optic disc, right? So <coughs> let's look at the optic disc. Now this is, these are the patient's optic disc. Please have a look. So anybody, what do you see here? Huh? Where? Good. Now, in this patient, where should the field effect be? All right. But is that enough? What do you see on the right side? Just look at it more carefully. What is up there? Pupil is dilated, so who sent this patient to you? <laughs> Retina specialist. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, is there anything else? Right? You're correct. So now will you accept this field on the face while you? No. So what are you going to do? Undilated, we will repeat. All right. Good. <clears throat> so now. Suppose you've done on this, 
what are you likely to miss? You have done it 11.5 millimeters. What are you likely to miss? What is the disadvantage of dilated pupil? What? What will increase? Even if it's slow, it will increase in this. It will look falsely a better field, right? And then you cannot have like this forever. Normal pupil size will remain normal, consistent always. Dilated could be exclusively dilated, 11 millimeter, 8 millimeter, so every time it will be different, right? What else is missing? Something missing up there. Visual acuity, perfect. Why do we want this visual acuity? Yes? One person, answer quickly. These are very small questions, very basics. Two? Say clearly, can't hear, it's a little louder. Could be, but this field is not depressed. Still we need it. No, presbyopia or refraction, they will put some glasses somewhere. They put glasses already. Is there anything we connect visual acuity with that's very relevant in the visual field? Retina man has sent the field to you. No, no, retina person has sent the visual field to you. What is the foveal threshold out there? How does this relate with visual acuity? Suppose this patient has visual acuity of 624. Suppose he has 624. The previous person was right, there could be refractive error, but the same patient had six by six and there 25. What will happen? It's a macular disease, right? So you have answered all, all of them right, so all of you chocolate, right? <laughs> now, what are you seeing that arrow on top? It's in front of what? Test duration. Is it all right? Less or more? It's okay. It's Sita. All right. It's good. Patient is good. It's Sita test. It's not like it's not a threshold. Tell me, in this visual field, normally where do you see reliability indicators? On top. Is there anything else in this visual field that is showing you reliability indicator, which is done far more times? It is done hundreds of times rather than those few uh, 10, 15, something like that, fixation losses or something like that. Is there anything in this entire field? Look up, down, all over the place. Huh? What? Yes. Speak, speak. What's that? Yes. So these are what happens here. Why do these spikes come? Where are they taken? They're taken on the cornea. Right? On the center. So when the eye is moving, it will, the, the, image, the image will be taken from the cornea only. This is actually a more sensitive indicator than those. Many times you will feel in clinical practice, all that looks normal, but the field is not normal. The patient doesn't have anything to prove. So not look there, only look here as well, right? Now you see something out down there, a VFI. So what is VFI? So how is how's that made? Anderson criteria doesn't say VFI. It says MD, right? But that's actually a little old now. VFI is something much better. So how does MD differ from VFI? You have one more session, you know, after this. So if you don't activate yourself, 
for next two hours, there'll be a challenge, right? So how is MD and VFI, they differ from each other? It's very vital. You see these two things here? One here and one here? I want to make it very simple for you. The sum of this divided by the numbers is your MD. So therefore, MD will be reduced in any damn thing is coronal opacity, is a cataract, is whatever. Now watch this. Pattern deviation. So VFI to pattern deviation is same as what MD is to total deviation. Therefore, what are you gonna get in this? It is more specific glaucoma loss. Where will be the fallacies? Nothing is without fallacies. Tell. If the total field is so depressed that you're not getting pattern deviation. Nay, if it's so depressed, then you will not get decent VFI numbers. All right. Now in this patient, you're seeing something right in the center out there. So now what will you order? 10-2, why 10-2? Here, what is the problem? Why do we take a 10-2? We are taking how many points in the center? 10, 10 degrees? How many points in central 10 degrees? Huh? Central 10 degrees in this field, how many points? Not 16 points. Come down. Come down. Go home and check. I will not tell you everything here. Okay. Don't go on the total numbers. In 10 dash 2, how many you have total points in 10 degrees? At least 10 times higher points than this. All right. What else will you keep in mind? It's right there, in the center. Every patient who comes to Royal doesn't tell you, you have, I have glaucoma. I can have something else also. Patient doesn't tell he has glaucoma, she has glaucoma, we decide, right? So what, one more thing you have to keep in mind. When is something like this, only involving one quadrant, I'm not saying it is, but uh, just keep in mind that neurofield is a very much possibility. So what is here? Huh? What? Are you looking at the pupil diameter now? <laughs> it's the same patient on pilocarpin for last 30 years. This is pilocarpin for last 30 years that I, one millimeter pupil. Maximum dilatation is 2.5 millimeters. Right, so this is the impact of pupil. So large pupil is not as bad as is the small pupil. Chandrima, whenever time gets over, just let me know because I, I just kept it like. So what do you see these two fields? Are they different or the same? Yes, somebody said 24 to C. What is 24 to C? What is this field? This will come in a recent advances. It's in Humphrey 840 onwards. Sita faster. C C you have Sita and Sita fast. This is Sita faster, right? So you're right. But what is special about this field? Is, is it only faster? Or there is something else. Yes, 10 dash 2 component, but how much of 10 dash 2 component fitted in this? Just 10 more points have been added in the center. So one thing is, it's something nice to have, something newer to have, but caveat is as good as Sita, but actually it's not as good as 10 dash 2. There is no evidence-based study that says that it is as good as 10 dash 2, right? So you can use it as on today. You can use it in lieu of 
theta, but not in lieu of theta, uh, not in 10 dash, uh, theta 24 dash 2, but not lieu in lieu of 10 dash 2. 10 dash 2 is still stands as good as before. The good thing is the time taken. Test duration is almost to half. Therefore, you can do for a many more patients, these days costing of machines, Humphreys raised the cost by double. So in one day, you can pool in. Another thing is don't each one of you buy a visual field in your clinic. Pool in, learn to pool in the equipment. You will have a lot more. Now here, in a field like this, when macula is threatened, what do we do? Very important, Kirti is to operate a patient, 24-2 is done, now she is worried about something, that whether I should do a trab or not do a trab. <laughs> <laughs> so it's telling me that the time is over, I think. <laughs> I think I'll finish with this because the time is over, right? So now tell me what is what is there? She knows everything, but it's still she wants, she's not comfortable, this macula is threatened. What does it mean by threatened? Yes, yes, I'm hearing the word right. Speak. Split, it's a split. Is it a split or not split? Again, you go back to 10-2, if it's a split, then think twice, do a good counseling that this snuff out or wash out is a possibility. It's not that it will happen in every patient. It doesn't happen often, not more than one in a thousand patients, but it happens, right? So the counseling has to be different. So with that, I'll say <laughs> bye to you because my destination to write has been told to me. <laughs> now I think all the people are there, so uh, you people can have your questions, or I think the consultant should ask them questions because they're not. Yes, yeah, still nine minutes to go. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So, any questions from either the house or the faculty? I think residents must have lots of Is it open and do I can go on. SLT. First, first option. First choice. Try that out first. If that works. If that doesn't work, then you can come. Actually, we can buy time. It's as simple as that. In the meantime, Tito is being, we make it better and then go on. And take your corneal colleague's opinion. Please, OSD is treatable in most of the patients. OSD has loads and loads of treatments other than TSD. No? So non-tier OSD treatment plus I take I would take TSD even uh, SLT in young patients also for a simple reason because they have a long life to live. So therefore, don't spoil their uh, pending calva with that because trap later will be even worse. Yes. Listen, in exam you will have only two choices: either you ask or you will be asked. If you don't ask, we'll ask you. Older the teachers, they become bigger shamers. Then they start asking only. They don't like to. <laughs> yes. Squint has been taught to you so well. Why don't you ask questions on squint? IOP, you need to ask questions, actually. IOP needs to be covered a little better. So. Yes. 
what do you all use? Which chronometers you all use? Hands up for explanation. Okay. Who are the patients in which, in whom you are not able to use, you're not able to use alpination chronometer? Kids? Huh? Scarred corneas? And? Huh? Edematous corneas you can use, but the, it comes slow. And? avoidable in immediate post-operative period. So now I will take it. You're going for a community screening camp. What chronometers you will want to use? <laughs> Patient has to lie down. You may not get a couch. <laughs> tonopen, you'll do standing sitting. Can do, but tonopen standard lying down only. No, that's what we are used to. Pascal. Good is good is rebound tonometer. Rebound tonometer. Rebound is ideal tonometer for community screening. For who all is rebound ideal tonometer? Because rebound is less relatively uh, newer tonometer. Examiners would want to ask about it. That is rebound. That's rebound. That's rebound. So where all do we use eye care tonometer? No, no mumbling, no, no rumbling. I told you one screening screening in the community camps. Where else? Ward, wheelchair, huh? Home monitoring. Home monitoring also is now available. You are right. The, it's a different one with a cup here, and it. it I just, where else? What is the contact area in rebound tonometer? Huh? Point nine. So therefore, in corneals, will it not be good? In children, will it not be good? You cannot give GA 100 times to a child. Even you're monitoring glaucoma patient, pediatric glaucoma, but you can't give UA. You cannot give chloral hydrate also. That has, that needs some amount of monitoring. So what do you do? Rebound, even like, even one-year-old child also gets it done. Otherwise, that trigger fish is too expensive for these people. Give the exam points of view. Huh? Uh, so tell me, uh, for the kids, OCT question for kids? Where should we screen the children? And where should we match the children? Question ends in five minutes. We are done. We are done. Five minutes, no? Five minutes is a long time. Yeah. So in OCT, tell me how many of you all have OCT access? I think all of you should have. All of you have, right? So which all machines do you all have? This is a very important question for OCT. Which all machines do you all have? Huh? OptiView. OptiView. Okay, somebody else? Zeiss. Heidelberg. Heidelberg, right? So why I want this point is that one OCT printout, one OCT numbers are not same for other. So from your school, a patient goes to their school, it's not same. The floor effect in each one of is different. RT view has the highest floor, like opto view what you're saying is that it's got the highest floor. And those who have a spectralis, they have the lowest floor. So therefore you have to compare OCT of each machine with that machine only. Uh, it's, it's not comparable with other machines. And same thing is for all these uh, numbers also. Even the wavelength of each one is different. So therefore, don't try and compare. Like Humphrey and Octopus are not compare comparable. 
I used Humphrey as a because normally most of the people have. But OCT has got a major challenge. Retina setups usually have spectralis, and glaucoma people are sharing it. Actually, glaucoma and retina are going piggyback to each other. So this thing, but uh, you have to remember all these things. Uh, these are important things to remember for OCT. going to be a must know area and uh, again for skill training you must know tonometry and gonioscopy which is a must for the squint things I don't know we have covered squint and uh, glaucoma today. A squint generally uh, lots of questions smaller questions actually come in the exam short notes are there and how many of examiners have actually Maddox wing with them now sir we don't have Maddox wing any functional anymore. Is it functional anymore? But some examiners yes. still <laughs> persist in asking Maddox wing, which is available. Nahi hai. So this is, a, this is a request to examiners. When some things are obsolete, which are not available, please let's not ask students about them. Yeah. But it's not available. It's not actually available now anymore. So where would they have seen it? They wouldn't have seen it. <laughs> no. Maddox wing, actually, Sitapur has got everything ancient you can think of also we have it. But everything new to everything old we have, I but no, nobody will fail you on that. The morale of the student goes down when they don't know answers. They and failed on PBCT. That's right. PBCT is what they failed on. I'm always like, if you don't know PBCT, then just remember PBCT is one test on which if you don't know correct. Hirschberg, ocular motility, PBCT, these things you have to know. If you, if you don't know Sinato 4 well, it's all right. Nobody will really distinguish you because they would never ask you to make a Maddox chart like that. But definitely, PBCT, you fail, you fail. So this is one crux of all the squint. We are done, after I think. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What is the ideal time? CETA, CETA standard, CETA fast strategy, depending on what strategy it is. Usually it takes around less than five to six, five to six minutes, usually. Again, patient can pause, no moment, but you know, if you, the patient is pausing the uh, button on the mouse, the, the machine pauses, so the time stretches for that, so that will be. So which strategy you're using depending on that?